Good evening and uh, welcome to our second service on this Easter Sunday. I don't have any announcements and so I'm going to ask you all to stand as we have a brief moment of silent prayer and we ask the Lord to bless this service. Let's bow together before him. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight in worship and we know that it is often easy for us to uh, go through the motions or to have our minds and hearts distracted with other things. Uh, We pray that we would worship you this evening in spirit and in truth. Uh, We pray that our hearts would be filled with gratitude uh, for who you are and for all that you have done for us. Uh, We thank you especially that on this day we could remember the resurrection of Christ and rejoice and the great hope that that gives to us. And so bless this service now, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Psalm 20, or first, second Samuel 22 is our call to worship. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. Uh, That's a great reminder to us as we prepare to go into uh, a new week and serve the Lord that that he is our refuge, he is our stronghold, and uh, the wonderful truth, of course, that he is our Savior. And he greets us tonight, and so receive the greeting of our God and King, grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father and from his Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are going to confess the Apostles' Creed together, page 148 in the Forms and Prayers book. Almost every Sunday night we, we say these words and uh, tonight maybe they take on a, uh, an added significance of when we confess that uh, Jesus on the third day rose again from the dead. Uh, that, as I said this morning, changes everything for us. It, it gives us hope, it gives us joy, it gives us comfort. And so, uh, with faith in the Lord's promises, let's say these words together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We're going to sing a portion of Psalm 103. It's 103C. Come, my soul, and bless the Lord. All within me bless his name. We'll sing uh, the first four stanzas, and let's remain standing as we sing.
Please take the Forms and Prayers book and turn to page 218. 218. We are going to uh, veer tonight from our pattern of going through the canons, and we're going to uh, read a portion of the Heidelberg Catechism together. I thought it was fitting to do this on Easter Sunday as a, a reminder to us of uh, the benefits of Christ's resurrection. And before we read it, I, I do want to remind all of us um, that the Heidelberg Catechism is intensely practical. Uh, we, we might view these confessions and, and catechisms as you know, mere doctrine or theology, kind of disconnected from our day-to-day lives, but um, especially the Heidelberg is, is very personal and it's very practical. And, and so tonight, as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, I, I want us to see uh, how beautifully the Heidelberg reminds us of the benefits of Christ's resurrection. And so I will read the question, and then together, let's confess the answer. How does Christ's resurrection benefit us? First, by his resurrection, he has overcome death, so that he might make us share in the righteousness he obtained for us by his death. Second, by his power, we too are already raised to a new life. Third, Christ's resurrection is a sure pledge to us of our blessed resurrection. Three things. Don't need to really go over them too much because you all can read them and pretty simple, but essentially it's talking about the past, present, and future. Uh, The past is the first one. Christ has overcome death. Uh, Second, we have been given presently new life. You are a new creature in Christ, the Bible says. You're not the same old person you were before Christ. And third, the future, you have a marvelous future, Christian, ahead of you. You have a marvelous promise that just as Jesus was raised from the dead, so you too will one day be raised from the dead. That's highly encouraging and comforting to us and a a wonderful uh, reminder of the benefits that we have because Christ is risen. And, And it should hopefully make us love the Lord more and praise him more. And and we're going to sing together of that love now. 18b, I love you, Lord, my strength. Taken from Psalm 18, we will sing stanzas one through five. And let's again stand as we sing.
the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we we praise you and we thank you tonight uh, for the wonderful truth, the reality that we just confess together that Jesus Christ, our Savior, has overcome death, uh, that he has earned the righteousness for us that we must have to stand before you, that we have been raised to new lives and, and that his resurrection is a guarantee of our glorious future resurrection one day. And so, Father, as we just sang from Psalm 18, we, we love you, we praise you, we worship and adore you for all that you have done for us. Lord, every other religion in this world is a hopeless religion. Every other religion is a religion that places a tremendous burden and weight upon people's shoulders as, as they think they have to earn their way to heaven. And, and Lord, apart from your grace, we would think the same way. And, and yet Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We thank you tonight for your grace. We thank you for causing each one of us to see our sin Uh, to see our need for Christ, to come to him in faith. And now, Lord, because of him, we have peace with you. And and we have a, a great hope, a hope that there is something far better than this life. Lord, may we praise and thank you all the days of our lives. And whether we are young or old, we pray that we would serve you with the time that we have and help us to glorify you in all that we do. We pray for Christian ministry and mission around the world. We pray that you would bless the reading and the preaching of your word in all of your churches, that it may not return void without accomplishing all that you ordained for it. We pray that you would raise up pastors and missionaries to go into your fields of harvest, that the gospel would be faithfully proclaimed Uh, that this whole world would be filled with the knowledge of your truth. In in that connection, we pray for the seminaries we support, for Mid-America and for Westminster. We pray that you would continue to bless both of those schools as they train men in the gospel ministry. Help them both to remain faithful to your word and to our reform confessions. We, We pray that the students there would be Uh, given excellent education, that they would be trained to preach Christ-centered sermons and that they would go out where you send them to preach Christ. We pray for your church. We pray that you would make us holy even as you are holy. We pray that our love for one another would abound and grow. We pray that we would grow in, in knowledge and discernment, that you would enable us to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. We pray for those who govern us and lead us in the civil realm that you would give to them wisdom and discernment. May they make wise choices. May they lead us in ways that are honoring to you and to your truth. We pray tonight for those who are afflicted. For those who are sick, we pray that they would be healed. For those who mourn, we pray that they would be comforted. For those who are weary and heavy laden, we pray that they might find rest. For those who are discouraged or depressed, we pray that they would know your joy. And for those who are anxious, we pray that they would know the peace that passes all understanding. Father, again, we thank you for the blessing of Lord's Day worship. We thank you for the freedom, the health that we have to be here tonight. We thank you for this day, especially the one day every year that we focus upon the resurrection of our Savior. We thank you that he is risen. He is ascended. He is seated at your right hand, and he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We thank you that you hear our prayers tonight. May we give cheerfully, and we pray that as we open your word that you would teach us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We now give to Mel Dodinga, and that offering will now be taken.
Thank you, Teresa. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles tonight and turn to the Old Testament, to the book of Job, Job chapter 19. Uh, Job is uh, right before the book of Psalms, Job 19. Uh, we will be reading verses 25 through 27. Throughout my uh, years in the ministry, I've, I've done a number of funerals and graveside services, and uh, this is one of the passages that I almost always read at a, a graveside service. Uh, but it's not just a, a passage for, in a sense, dying, it is also a passage for living. And it's also a passage that uh, points us to uh, the resurrection, and so we want to see that tonight. Job 19 uh, verses 25 through 27. Job says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Most of us probably would um, like to travel back in time for something. Imagine that we could travel back in time. Imagine that we could travel back in time 461 years ago to the year 1563. Life in 1563 was way different than life is in 2024. In 1563, life expectancy was 47 years old. Today, in 2024, it's about a little over 79 years old. In 1563, uh, women couldn't even own property. Today, rightly so, they can. In 1563, there were no iPhones, there were no smart TVs, there were no cars, there were no planes, there was no social media. It was a, it was a totally, radically different world in many, many ways. But... If we were to go back to 1563, one thing that would be the same is the way that this world could be described. Now, many of you know that the year 1563 for us reform people is a very significant year because that's the year the Heidelberg Catechism was written. Heidelberg Catechism, of course, is a wonderful document. It's written in question-answer form. Uh, it serves as a, a great summary, a faithful summary of the main teachings of Scripture. The, the men who wrote the catechism were very young. They, they were only 28 and 26 when they wrote the catechism. And, and there's a certain part in the catechism, it's in question and answer 26, that accurately sums up the realities of this world, whether you were living 461 years ago or whether you're living today. These two men call this world, in question and answer 26, a veil of tears. Children, the word veil just means um, valley. This, this world, this life, is a valley of tears. Most of us, I think, have firsthand experience with this. The, the fact that life is filled with adversity, that, that life is filled with trials, that Life goes in a direction that we wish it wouldn't have gone. It's filled with difficult challenges. And, and the question that we might ask in the middle of a challenge is, is there any hope? Is there any comfort that, that I can find as a Christian in, in the midst of this valley of tears? T today is Easter Sunday. Today we focus our attention on the, the empty tomb, on the fact that Jesus Christ is not in that tomb. He's risen He's alive. And, and brothers and sisters, it is, it is this reality that Jesus is alive that, that gives you hope that there is something, you know, beyond this veil, this valley of tears. Uh, tonight, we're going to look at a passage of the Bible that, that foreshadows the resurrection of Jesus. But it does more than that. It, it foreshadows your resurrection. It, it reminds you tonight what will be true for you one day. And, and you may be young. You may have many, many years ahead of you. None of us know, of course. But, but this is what awaits us one day. 
The, the beautiful hope of the resurrection that gives us an unshakable confidence and foundation, not only for the life to come, but, but also for this present life. Job was an amazing man. Job, the very first book of, or very first chapter of Job, describes him this way. It says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. That's a great way to be described. Wouldn't, wouldn't you love it one day for, for people to describe you that way? He or she was a person who feared God and turned away from evil. Job was not a perfect man, but, but he was a faithful follower of the Lord. He had a big family. He had seven sons. He had three daughters. He was very blessed materially. Uh, chapter 1 tells us Job had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a number of servants. God had greatly blessed this man. But, but Job, as you know, was a man who suffered immensely. In fact, his name is synonymous with suffering. Most of you know the, the story at the beginning of Job. One day, a, a messenger comes to him and he says, um, all of your animals have been stolen and all of your farmhands have been killed. As that man is talking to him, another messenger shows up and he says, fire has fallen from heaven and burned up all your sheep and all your shepherds. They're all gone. Then a third messenger shows up as the second guy is talking. The third guy arrives and he says, thieves have come, they've stolen your camels, and they've killed your servants. Animals are stolen, the farmhands are killed, the sheep and shepherds killed by fire, the camels stolen, the servants killed. It gets worse. Fourth messenger shows up and he says, Job, your, your children were all gathered together for a party and a powerful windstorm hit the house, the house collapsed, and all your children are dead. Imagine, if you can, how overwhelmed with grief you would be. He's lost it all. That was Job. And he wasn't a stoic. He, he didn't receive this news with a stiff upper lip and say, well, that's just the way it is. That's the, the hand that I've been dealt this news hit him, it hit him hard. He, he tore his robe in grief, he shaved his head, he fell to the ground. This intense suffering brought him to his knees. Job was a, a broken man, and we appreciate this about Job because we can relate to him. We can relate to a man who was hit this hard because the authors of the catechism were right. This life is a veil of tears. But it was in the midst of this suffering that, that Job found an amazing hope. It was in the midst of this suffering that, that Job experienced great joy. And there are two things that we want to see in this short passage tonight. Uh, first of all is Job's personal knowledge. And secondly, there is Job's certain hope. His personal knowledge and his certain hope. Look at verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer lives and at the last, he will stand upon the earth. Do you notice Job says he knows something? Now, now first of all, it's important to understand this, this isn't just, a, this isn't just a, a head knowledge kind of thing, is it? Children, do you know what head knowledge is? Head knowledge, here's an example of head knowledge. If, if I were to ask you, do you know what two plus two equals? You would all say, I, I know that two plus two equals four. Or if I said, do you know what state we live in? You would say, I know that we live in the state of California. That's, that's head knowledge. But here in verse 25, when, when Job says, I know, it, it's more than just informational head knowledge. This is a, a personal knowledge. This is an intimate knowledge. This is like saying, I know that my spouse loves me. I know that my parents love me. It's, it's that kind of knowledge. And notice what Job knows. Three things he has personal knowledge of. First of all, he knows he has a redeemer. The word redeemer here is, is a word that means someone who is going to vindicate you, someone who is going to prove your innocence. Now, now understand what, what he means here. It's important to understand the context of this book. 
Again, Job suffered greatly. Possessions gone, servants dead, children's dead. And you remember Job has three friends who come to him and they say to him, Job, you're, you're suffering so much because you have unconfessed sin in your life. I mean, great friends, right? That's how they comfort you. But, but Job says, I know that there's a redeemer. I know that he's my redeemer. And I know that one day he's going to vindicate me. In other words, he's going to show that I wasn't suffering because of some sin in my life. And so he knows he has one who will vindicate him. Secondly, he knows that his Redeemer lives. He has this heartfelt, personal knowledge that his Redeemer is not dead. You know, there's, there's no hope in a dead Redeemer. I, I said that to you this morning, right? Confucius is dead. Uh, Buddha's dead. Muhammad's dead. Joseph Smith's dead. All these founders of these religions are dead. There's no hope in a dead Redeemer. A few years ago, I, I shared with you, I think, how Thomas Jefferson's Bible ends. Thomas Jefferson's Bible is a monstrosity. It's a, it's a cut and paste Bible. Jefferson cut out the parts he didn't like, the parts he couldn't understand, the parts that he thought were, were too crazy to believe. And his Thomas Jefferson's Bible ends with this. Jesus', Jesus disciples rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. That's it for Jefferson. That's how the story ends. Jesus is dead, but not to Job. I know that my Redeemer is alive, Job says. Christian, you can echo that this morning, this evening. Your Redeemer is alive. He's every bit as alive as you and I are alive right now. He is at the right hand of the Father. He is seated. He's praying for you. His work is finished. He's accomplished your salvation, and he is alive. Job says, I know I have a Redeemer. I know my Redeemer lives. And third, Job says, I know that my Redeemer will stand upon the earth. This is a very interesting phrase. The, the word that is translated earth can also be translated dust, or powder, or ashes. And, and interestingly, it's the same word that's used in Genesis when it says that God formed man of the dust of the earth, dust of the ground. It's the same word that we find in Genesis when God says to Adam, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. It's talking about death. It's talking about the grave there. And so I think you put all of this together and I think that what's happening here is that Job is looking forward to the day when his Redeemer will rise to stand on the grave. When his Redeemer will stand in triumph over death. Job says, no matter what I may be going through in my life, no matter the hardships or the difficulties or the trials or the pain or the grief, I know these three things personally. I know that my Redeemer lives. I know he will vindicate me. I know that he will stand upon this earth. And there's a sense in which all of us are on this side of Easter. And, and we have an even more intimate knowledge of this, don't we? Job didn't have the New Testament. We have God's complete canon, his complete revelation. And, and he declares to us that Jesus Christ is alive. We have a Redeemer. We have a Redeemer who has redeemed us. You have one who came to conquer death on your behalf. You have one who continues to pray for you every day. You know that one day your, your Redeemer will vindicate you. He will declare your innocence before the Father because your faith is in him. Christian, he, he acted on your behalf. He did for what you what you could not do for yourself. Second, you also know not only that you have a Redeemer, you know that your Redeemer lives. Jesus is no longer in the grave. The tomb isn't empty, or is empty. This is not just, you know, wishful thinking. The, the resurrection of Jesus really, truly happened in history. We, we saw this morning, Mary Magdalene, the other women saw the empty tomb. 
The disciples saw the risen Christ. More than 500 people saw the risen Christ at one time. Jesus is risen from the dead. He is alive. He has conquered death. He's conquered the grave. And, and third, you can also say with Job, you know that he has stood upon the earth. Christmas time in December, we celebrate the incarnation. We celebrate the fact that Jesus came to this earth and took on a truly human nature. Friday night, on Good Friday, we remember that he suffered and died for us, and today we rejoice that he stood on the grave. That means he conquered the enemy of death. So, so that you and I can say with faith, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Jesus has taken that sting away. We, we know these things. We know them with a personal, intimate knowledge because God in his grace has chosen to reveal them to us and to place these truths upon our hearts. Job had this certain, sure knowledge, and we have it too. But he also had a certain hope. Look at verse 26. And after my skin has been thus destroyed... Yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. Job says that his skin is going to be destroyed. Job is a, a realist. Job starts with the reality of his own mortality. He, he knows he's not going to live forever. He knows that, that, that one day he's going to die. And short of Jesus coming back in our lifetime, we're going to die. Job was, was facing already some, some very serious health issues. Listen to chapter 2, verse 7. It says, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and he struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And Job took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Job, all over his body, was struck with these horrible sores. And, and he takes a, a piece of broken pottery to, to scrape himself to try and eliminate the pain. We look at chapter 7 of Job. We, we see some of the results of this illness or disease. He was unable to sleep. He had um, crusted sores all over his body. He suffered from terrible nightmares. And, and all of this led Job to, to fall into depression. And so here is Job. His, his skin is already being destroyed, and he knows that one day he's going to die. And, and when he dies, he's going to be placed in the grave, and his body is going to decay. Studies show that if a body isn't embalmed, it, it takes about 10 years for a body to be nothing but bones. And, and Job basically says, that's, that's where I'm going. That's where I'm headed. Bad news for us, I guess, is that's where we're headed to. That's what's going to happen to us. Now you might say, well, I thought this was about Job's hope. This doesn't seem very hopeful. But, but notice that Job doesn't stop there. Job, Job doesn't say, you know, I'm going I'm to die and my, my skin is going to rot and I'm going to be nothing but bones and that's it. Job's not Thomas Jefferson. Jesus died and, and he's buried and that's it. Job says, notice, with the voice of faith, we walk by faith, not by sight, he says, yet in my flesh I shall see God. An amazing statement to make. My, my skin's going to be destroyed, my body's going to decompose, and yet one day I'm going to see him. I'm going to see God. Go, how is that possible? How can, a, how can a body go into the ground and become nothing more than bones and, and one day this body is able to see? That's the wonder of the resurrection. He's confident that, that one day God will raise his body from the grave in a glorious resurrection body and he will see God with his own two eyes. Now you say, well, the Bible says God is spirit. How, how, how can... How can Job say that he will see God? Well, I think that whether Job fully knew it or not, he, he was looking forward to Jesus. 
When Jesus came to this earth, he, children, you know, he took to himself a truly human nature. And, and today, right now, Jesus has a physical body. And, and one day, isn't this amazing? One day, we will see Jesus with our own two resurrected eyes. What, what a day that will be. Christian, you, you can have the same confident hope and the same expectation that belonged to Job. You can say tonight, just like Job, I know this. I know this. I, I know that he's my redeemer. I know that he's conquered death for me. And I know that one day, even though my body may go into the grave, I know that one day he will raise my body and I myself will see him. Job says, I myself will see him. You're going to see Jesus one day. You and I belong, body and soul, to Jesus. We are going to have real, physical bodies for all eternity, just like the real, physical bodies we have now. But there will be a major difference. When Jesus returns, you and I will get these new glorified, resurrected bodies, no more sin, no more disease, and no more death. Death will not be the end for the Christian. Death, Christian, will not have the final word on your life. A lot of people don't have this hope. A lot of people live their lives with the eat, drink, and, and be merry for tomorrow we die philosophy Live it up because tomorrow we may go out of existence. But, but God has given us graciously the eyes to see and the hearts to believe that there is a life beyond this one. And even though our skin will be destroyed, even though our bodies will be lowered into the grave, even though our bodies will decompose, they will one day be raised. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. That was Job's hope. That's your hope tonight. And notice what this hope did for Job. Notice what this personal knowledge produced in Job. Notice what Job says, the very last line of verse 27, my heart faints within me. You see, Job was not left unaffected by truth. What, what he confessed affected him. I, I know I have a redeemer. I know my redeemer lives. I know I'm going to be raised to life one day. I know I'm going to see my redeemer with my own two eyes. These truths have an impact on Job. He, he says here again, my heart faints within me. This is very interesting. Literally, in the Hebrew, what Job says here is my kidneys are wasting away within me. Now, now, that's really strange to our modern ears. If someone comes up to you tonight and says, hey, my kidneys are wasting away within me, you're going to go, we need to get you to ER right away. But, but that was an expression in that day. It was an expression of joy. It was, it was like today, it would be like us saying, my heart just soared when I heard that news. Now, when you say that, you, you don't mean the heart, your heart came out of your chest and flew around the room and then came back to you. It, it's an expression of joy. It's an expression of thankfulness. It's a way to, to express joy, and that's the same thing here. Jo, Job says, what, what joy there is in knowing that I have a Redeemer, and he lives, and he will one day bring me to himself. That the gospel doesn't leave us unmoved, does it? It, it doesn't leave us unemotional or, or unaffected. Sometimes we reformed people can, can get this label of being, you know, the frozen chosen or, or we're just not that excited about our faith. And 
Sometimes that might be true to a certain degree, but the gospel doesn't leave us unemotional and unaffected. This, this truth should excite you, excite Job. My, my kidneys are wasting away within me. It should excite us. We, we have the same joy. It's, it's the joy of knowing, listen, that Jesus fully paid for all of my sins. The Heidelberg Catechism says, fully paid for all of my sins. He didn't do his part and leave the rest to you. He didn't do most of it and leave some for you. He did it all. It's the joy of knowing that he has redeemed me, body and soul. It's the joy of knowing that though my skin will one day be destroyed, I will in my new resurrection body see my Savior. And and do you know why we can be so certain of this? It's because of what we celebrate today. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul, Paul spends almost that whole chapter talking about the resurrection. And he makes the point that if if Jesus isn't risen, if, if he's still in the grave, if the three women show up at the tomb and the, and the rock is still there and he's still inside, Paul says, we are of all people the most to be pitied. People should feel sorry for us if, if we're following this, this dead savior. We're foolish, we're wasting our time if he's still in the grave. And then Paul says this in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The first fruits refers to the, the first sample of the fruit. And the, and the first sample of the fruit is an indication of how the rest of the crop will turn out. The point Paul is making is, is a beautiful one. He is saying that the resurrection of Jesus is an indication, it's a sample, if you will, of what our resurrection will be like. Jesus was raised imperishable, never to die again. Jesus was raised in glory. Jesus was raised in power. And so will we. Jesus' resurrection, as we heard from the Heidelberg earlier, is the guarantee. It's the ironclad guarantee you can take it to the bank kind of guarantee that that is what your resurrection will be like when Jesus comes back. Now Job saw all of this rather dimly. Job lived way, way, way back, didn't he? Job saw it on the other side of the cross. But we are blessed to see all of this on this side of the cross. We we look back and and we see the cross. We see the empty tomb. If Job's kidneys were wasting away within him, how much more should our kidneys be wasting away within us? How much more joy should we have? Many of you have stood by a grave and, and you have watched a spouse, a friend, family member, a loved one lowered down into that grave. And your grief and your mourning was and is very, very real. Death is not a natural thing. Death is not part of God's original creation. And you've stood there in Ripon Cemetery or maybe somewhere else and and you've watched that. It's not natural. It's not how God created this world. And yet, as we saw Friday night, it was through sin that death entered into this world. Some of you tonight still have weighing heavily on your heart the death of a loved one doesn't go away entirely in this life you have God's promise 
that every one of your believing loved ones who have been lowered into the ground will one, be, one day be raised to glory. They will be given glorious resurrection bodies that will never grow old. They will never contract disease. They will never die and leave you. That's God's promise. And the same thing is true for you, by the way. That's God's promise to you. The authors of the catechism were right that this life is a valley of tears. It's filled with pain, it's filled with sorrow, it's filled with hurt and disappointment. It's filled with paths that we didn't expect or anticipate. God hasn't promised us a perfect life. He hasn't promised us no pain and no suffering. But he has told us that Jesus came for us and he has risen for us. And because he died and was buried and was risen, if you believe in him, you will join in that glorious resurrection one day. And so, brothers and sisters, set your heart and your hope on that. You set your heart and your hope on the things of this life, you're always going to be disappointed. You set your heart and your hope on people or possessions or a profession, you'll always be disappointed. But you set your hope on Jesus and you will never be disappointed. And one day he's going to come back. What a glorious day that will be. And until then we live our lives with the sure and certain hope that we will see him one day with our own two eyes. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we know that um, this life is difficult at times. There are things that hurt us. There are things that trouble us. There are things that make us angry. There are circumstances and other things that cause us grief. There is death and loss and mourning and sadness. But Father, we thank you that Jesus has overcome sin and death and the grave. He has stood on the grave in triumph. And his victory is a guarantee of our future victory. Father, help us with the eyes of faith to confess what Job confessed. We know we have a redeemer. We know that our redeemer lives. We know that he has stood upon the grave. And we know that one day he will again stand upon this earth and he will take us to himself. We thank you and we praise you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Number 300. 57, the day of resurrection. We will sing all the stanzas and let's stand as we sing.
Number 291 is our doxology, O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. We'll sing stanzas one and seven. Before we hear the benediction, uh, I was thinking just a moment ago about the end of the book of Jude in light of the resurrection. And Jude says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. He is going to one day present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. That's amazing that because of Jesus, because he died and has risen from the dead, he will one day present you before the Father blameless. Now, I'm not blameless, and I don't think anybody here is. But one day, covered in the righteousness of Christ, because Christ is the victor, he will present you blameless in the presence of our Heavenly Father. And now he gives us his blessing. And so receive the blessing of our great God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.